Well, what we have before us is a very interesting title, which is telling us what the Bible has to say about the future events which are going to take place in this earth. And what we want to do, friends, is tell you why that's going to happen. Because God not only tells us it's going to happen, he tells us why. And perhaps we could do no better than to summarise the reason why this is going to happen first of all. And I would put it simply like this, that God is going to bring about this war because out of that God is going to humble the nations. And of particular interest, Egypt and Israel and Russia and ultimately all the nations of the world is going to humble them so that they will accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that particular area of Egypt and Israel, God is going to make a way by which the nations can make their way to Jerusalem to worship God. And that's the purpose that God has in bringing all these things to pass, that ultimately God might be exalted. And we saw at the end of that reading, it talks about the resurrection from the dead. Many, not all, that have slept in the dust of the earth are going to awake. <coughs> Some are going to receive everlasting life. Some are going to be condemned to return to the, to, to the ground. And those who receive everlasting life are going to be part of that glorious kingdom that God's going to establish in Jerusalem and from there teach the whole world about God and his, and his ways. And in order to do that, the world's going to need to be brought to a crisis where they will be forced and come to realise the absolute futility of what they've got and the need for them to turn to Almighty God. So that's a brief summary of what we're going to see this evening. Now let's have a look and see how the Bible actually explains it to us because the Bible indeed tells us this not once, not twice, a number of times. We're going to actually look at a few of those occasions. The first thing I'd like to do, friends, is actually have a look in the Bible where it talks about Russia. We want to go to the prophecy of Ezekiel, which is actually the previous book of the Bible, from Daniel, Ezekiel cha and chapter 38. Because in that Ezekiel chapter 38, Almighty God mentions Russia by name. Now have a look at that. Um, you won't actually find it in, our, in the translation if you've got the King James Version in front of you, but I'll show you where it is. Ezekiel and chapter 38, and we're going to just very quickly read verse 1 and 2. Because this is actually a prophecy about Armageddon. And we'll see that as we, as we proceed. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we're told, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now you see there that what I've actually done is I put below that a series of other translations. We put below there, we said Rotherham actually, where it's got the chief prince in the King James Version, in Rotherham, it says the princes of Rash. All right. In the Septuagint, it says Rosh, prince of Mesha. All right. New American Standard Bible says the prince of Rosh. The New King James Version, which is actually what, well, perhaps a, an updated version of the King James Version. The New King James Version says the prince of Rosh. And the word chief in your King James Version should actually be, a, well, it is actually a proper noun. So it should actually have a capital, and it should have been, shouldn't have been translated like it is. It actually means, it actually is, it really means the head, and it's the word rosh. It's the Hebrew word rosh. And then we can consult some encyclopedias and some, uh, some uh, lexicographers and authorities on this word in the Hebrew, rosh. And we're told the Encyclopedia Britannica says the name Russia is certainly derived from Rossia, from the Slav Slavonic Rus or Ross. So it comes from the name, modern name Russia, comes from this word Ross. All right, that's what the Encyclopedia Britannica says. Bocart, in his book Sacred Geography, says that Ross is the most, most ancient form under which history makes mention of Russia. And Stanley, in his book called The Jewish Church, he says the name Rus, or Hebrew Roas, or Septuagint Ross, unfortunately translated in the English version, the chief, first appeared in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 2, and 39, verse 1. It is the only name of a modern nation that appears in the Old Testament. And so it's talking about Russia. So here's Russia that's being spoken of. 
And God, Almighty God says, all right, this is what a group of nations headed up by Russia is going to do. Let's have a brief look at what that group of nations is going to do. Well, what we see if we make our way down this chapter is that Almighty God is going to, in verse 4, he's going to turn them back and put hooks in their jaws and draw them down into the land of Israel. All right? Now, that's what we're told there, verse 4, and coming down into, well, ultimately into verse 8. But what we're told there is that he would be a, that Russia would gather together with a company of nations. It wouldn't just be one nation, it will be a company of nations. And we're told that um, in, in verse 2, Gog, who is actually the ruler or the leader, he means the one at the top, he's going to uh, gather together these nations in verse 2, Mago, which is, is uh, the, the eastern area of Europe. We've got uh, Rosh, Meshach and Chu, which covers the whole land mass of modern Russia. Well, there, then we've got, um, you, know, you could go to, to verse, uh, verse 5. You've got Persia, Ethiopia and Libya. They're those, they're, well, we pretty well know where those areas are. You've got Goma, which is the Western European areas, and Tagama in verse 6, which is um, the areas around G Georgia and the Caspian Sea there. And so here we've got a group of nations that's going to be with Russia. All right? And Almighty God says, well, it's, a, it's going to be a company of nations. And he says that a number of times, verse 4, verse 7, verse 13, and verse 15. And that's a religious term. In the Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation, it's actually the word synagogue. So it's a, a, it's a religious company of nations that tells us that there's a religious reason why they're going to be gathered together. But nevertheless, for the purposes of the exercise tonight, it's a group of nations that's gathered together, not just one. And they're going to come, in verse 15, out of the north making their way down against the land of Israel. Now let's just read verse 15 and verse 16 carefully to, together. Verse 15, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, there's our word again, and a mighty army. So he's going to come from his place out of the north, but then he says in verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land and it shall be in the latter days and I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now there's one of the reasons. All right, we're going to come back and look at that later. But what we see here is he's going to come from his place out of the north but he's going to come up against the nation of Israel. Now, we could argue two points here. Firstly, Whenever you enter Israel, from a biblical point of view, you're going up. Right? Whether you're coming from the north or the south, you go up to Jerusalem. And that's ultimately where these nations are going to come. But the point is this. When Russia enters Israel, they will enter from the south because they'll have taken Egypt first. And we saw that, actually, if you read carefully in Daniel chapter 11. It's exactly what is going to happen. They'll come down, take Egypt first, and then make their way up into the land of Israel. So the scripture here is pinpoint accurate in that, that regard. But when Russia comes with all its group of nations against Israel, they will be opposed by some people. And we have those people in verse 13. Sheba and Dijan and the merchants of Tarshish with the young lions thereof. Now, I don't have time to really explain who that is, but it's talking, friends, about the British powers Britain and the young lions of Britain. Now, if you look up young lions and look for some, uh, you'll see some World War I and World War II cartoons if you Google it. And they're all Britain and they're young lions, and that includes Australia. So this is going to be not a little war, it's a world war. And if we think that we're going to be exempt, think again. It's a war that's going to encompass the whole world. And we're going to see how that is in actual fact the case. It's going to affect the whole world. And ultimately, the whole world is going to be changed forever by this war. So it is going to affect us. And that's something we need to stop and think about. But you know, when this happens, Almighty God is going to respond with force. Because it's something that we need to understand, friends, and that is that Israel, God describes as the apple of his eye. And just 
Think about what would happen if someone was to try and poke their finger in your eye. You would result, respond with a very, very strong reaction. And that's what God's going to do here. You don't touch Israel and get away with it. That's been the case down through history. Every nation that's touched Israel has copped it big time. And this will be no different. And so here we have the response of God in verse 19. Or well, verse 18, it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. It's a massive earthquake that's going to take place. And he describes what that earthquake's going to do in verse 20. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth are going to shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall. It actually has the idea of buildings with stairs, multi-storey buildings. They're all going to fall down. And every wall shall fall to the ground. That's catastrophic, isn't it? Because this event is going to turn the world upside down so that almighty God can establish the kingdom of God. And that's what it's going to do. And I'm going to show you later in this lecture where that earthquake is going to be centred and what the world says about the area right there. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And in verse 21, he says, For I will call for a sword against my, against, uh, throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. So they're going to turn their weapons on themselves. What we got in verse 21, and then there's God, Almighty God, fighting against them with disease and the forces of nature which he would divinely control in verse 22. And verse 23, that God might be magnified and known amongst the nations. All right, so there's a summary of what's going to happen from Ezekiel chapter 38. Now I want to go to another book of the Bible, and we're going to just put a little bit of a parallel. Okay? So what we've got, great company, they're going to come from the north, they're going to take Egypt, they're going to go against Israel, and they're going to be divinely judged and destroyed. All right, that's, that's, that's a summary of what, what, what we've looked at. All right, let's go to Joel. So Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel couple of books further on in the Bible, Joel and chapter 3, which is another chapter which talks about Armageddon. We're going to see there's a reason why we're very quickly just jumping through these chapters, because all we're going to do afterwards, we're going to come back and see the divine reasons that God has given he's going to do this, and they're in these chapters, all right? Joel chapter 3. In Joel chapter 3, God says in verse 1, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So that's 1948, the captivity of Judah was brought again. 1967, Jerusalem was recaptured by the Jews. It's this time period, friends, in which we're living. God says, this is what I'm going to do. I will gather all nations. So not just Russia, not just Russia and Europe, not just Russia and Europe and opposed by Britain. No. Massive. All nations. It's going to affect us all. If we think we're not going to be affected, think again. We'll gather all nations and I'll bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we'll plead or judge, as that word should be translated. I will judge them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land. There's, there's a reason that we're going to come back and investigate a little bit further. That's why God's going to bring them. So there's great company of nations that's going to come. And in verse 9 to 11, it talks about, what, about building up their arms, turning their, spears, sword, their plowshares into swords and their pruning hooks into spears in verse 10, and gathering themselves down into the valley of Jehoshaphat to be judged. And it has this idea of uh, the, of multitudes gathered into the valley of threshing all right, or the valley of decision and that's actually a play on the word Armageddon literally the word Armageddon simply means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment it's a play on these words in this very chapter that's what it's playing on 
And so that's why on the, on the overhead there we've said verses 12 to 14, it's talking about Armageddon because there's a, a multitude, a heap of sheaves. They're in a valley, the valley of Jehoshaphat, and they're going to be judged there. All right? And that's exactly what it says. Or threshed there. All right? Because the word decision in verse 14 could also be translated threshing. And my Bible actually in the centre margin tells us that's the case. So here we've got in Joel chapter 3 a bit of a parallel. Same, same battle being spoken of. And then in verse 15 and 16 we have the judgments that Almighty God's going to bring. All right? And he's going to save. He's going to be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So there's Almighty God going to, going to save the children of Israel and destroy those nations that have come against them. All right? So that's Joel chapter 3. Now let's go back to our reading to Daniel chapter 11. And we'll see that Daniel chapter 11 is talking about the same things again. You see, in chapter 11, you've got this king of the north and the king of the south. We want to just have a look at what the king of the north is going to do. All right? In verse 40, we're told the king of the north shall come against him. Now, I'll tell you that the him is the power in Constantinople, and I can prove that for you afterwards. But he's going to come against Constantinople, and he's going to then, then um, make his way down into Egypt, ultimately. But in verse 40, he's going to come with many ships, with chariots, with horsemen. He's going to come like a whirlwind in fury. All right? And in verse 41, we're told he's going to enter into the glorious land. In verse 42, he's going to make his way down into Egypt. And there he is, in verse 42, going down into Egypt. And then what's he going to do? Well, he's, we're told in verse 44 that there'll be tidings out of the north and out of the east that'll trouble him. And so when he gets down to Egypt, he's going to find that there's, there's someone in the north and someone in the east. And he doesn't know who they are, and he doesn't know what to do about it. So he's going to go forth, he says, and he's going to make his way and plant his, the tabernacle of his palaces, his headquarters, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, just there in Jerusalem. What did Joel chapter 3 say? The valley of Jehoshaphat, right there. That's where he's going to start. That's where he's going to set himself up. That's what we're told in verse 45. But verse 45 just says, but guess what? He's going to come to his end and none shall help him. That's a little short summary of those judgments, the earthquake, the, the every man's sword against his fellow. The, the, the disease and the pestilence and, the, and so forth that Almighty God spoke about in, jo, in, in, in Ezekiel chapter 38. So there's a little summary of that. And out of that, the kingdom of God is going to be established. So there we've got as a, a, a Daniel chapter 11 telling us about exactly the same events, just in some different words. Now what we'll do is we'll just take this little overhead here, which gives us a quick summary of what we've looked at so far. Because what we see on this overhead is that Russia is going to make their way down phase one into Constantinople. They're going to take Constantinople. And that makes him the king of the north. He's going to become the king of the north. Actually, he's going to become the king of the north before that, but he's going to take Constantinople. He's going to then make his way down into Egypt, as we saw in, in, in Daniel chapter 11. Make his way down into Egypt is after the treasures of Egypt. He's got a few scores to settle with. He got kicked out in the early 70s. They weren't too happy about it. All right? And then from Egypt, he's going to make his way up to the area of Jerusalem. And that's where Armageddon takes place. And he's going to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. So that's what's going to happen. All right? That's a summary of what we've seen in the, in the, the various passages we've quickly looked at. But what we want to answer, friends, is why. Why has God chosen for that to happen? Well, we're going to deal with Egypt and Israel sort of slightly separately, but in actual fact, the, the, both answers are totally related. Because it has to do with the purpose of God. You see, God does have a very positive purpose 
with Egypt. But God also has a much greater and very positive purpose with Israel. And God also has a purpose with the nations. And God's going to use these events to bring about that purpose. Now I want to come to another chapter of the Bible in, uh, which uh, gives us a little bit of a summary of, of these things in relation to Egypt specifically and that is Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. Now we put a lot of detail on that overhead there and we're not actually going to deal with a, a terrible lot of that detail from Isaiah chapter 19. But Isaiah chapter 19, suffice to say, is a prophecy about the smiting and healing of Egypt. All right? You can have a look at this prophecy in your own time, but effectively what it's saying is that what's going to happen is Egypt is going to come under the control in verse 2 to 4 of a cruel Lord. Now let's read it in verse 2 to 4. Um, verse 2 in actual fact. And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. So it's going, to be, it's going to come into civil war. Now it's very interesting. You follow the history of Egypt from when the British protectorate was lifted in the 1950s and I forget the names of the presidents, from about the late 1950s to about um, early 70s was uh, Mr Nasser, all right? Then from about then until the early 80s was Sadat, and then from about then until a couple of years ago was Mr Mubarak. So three presidents, three rulers in Egypt, all right? Since 2014, they've already had two. Things are starting to break down, aren't they? It's very interesting. Well, the Bible says it's going to, it's going to wind up in, a, in, in a, a quite a lot of turmoil. All right? In verse, verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 19. And, 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 and then he says, um, in verse 4, And the Egyptians I will give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord the Lord of Armies, or Lord of Hosts, the Lord of, Lord of Armies. So it's the militant title of God that God's using there. He says, I'm going to give them over into this cruel Lord, which is Russia. As Russia comes down in Daniel chapter 11 into Egypt, that cruel Lord's going to rule over them. But you know what, friends? Almighty God is going to save them from that. And what ultimately is going to happen, and we're going to jump now to, to verse... Uh, to verse um, 16, it says, In that day shall Egypt be like unto women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. So Almighty God's going to shake them. The reference to probably that earthquake that we saw in Ezekiel chapter 38. And Egypt's going to be, become subservient to Judah, to Israel in verse 17. And they're going to worship God in verse 18. They'll speak the language of Canaan or they'll speak the Hebrew language. The Canaanite will be gone completely. They'll speak the Hebrew language. Verse 19. They're going to set up an altar to Almighty God in Egypt. A reminder of the need for them to worship God. And let's come down to verse 23 to 24. We're just trying to pick up, pick the eyes out of the chapter. You can have a read of it in your own time, and I can certainly explain it a bit more afterwards if you like. This is what's ultimately going to happen. Well, verse 22, uh, And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. So they're going to turn to Almighty God. You see, that's the purpose that God has. He's going to judge them, but he's going to cause them to turn to him. And ultimately, what's going to happen is, verse 23, there's going to be a, a highway that's going to go out of Egypt through the land of Israel right up to Assyria. Now, what that highway is for is so that people can come into the land of Israel easily to worship God. You see why God is going to work with Egypt? So that he can get people access into the land of Israel. And they'll follow the route of the King's Highway, as it were, of the Old Testament times. The King's Highway, which is very similar to the route that the children of Israel took in the wilderness when they wandered through the wilderness and made their way into the land of Israel. It'll be a reminder of what happened then. And then we're told that in verse 24, Then shall Israel 
be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. And so instead of being enemies, Israel, Egypt and Assyria in the north, they're going to be friends. And friends because they all worship God together. So that's the change that's going to happen. So we've emphasised what's happening with Egypt. That's why God's going to bring Russia against Egypt. To put them in a position where they'll turn to God. Now we want to come and have a look and say, well, why Israel? Why is Russia going to come against Israel? And the answers are many. And the scriptures give us many answers. And we're going to attempt to, to pick out of the scriptures a number of them. And we got, what we're going to do is go back to the passages we've looked at and have a look at the answers that God gives. So first of all, we're going to go to Joel chapter 3. Because in Joel chapter 3, Almighty God gives the reason, gives a reason that he's going to gather all nations against Jerusalem. Joel chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. In Joel chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2, God says, I will, verse 2 particularly, I will also gather all nations, will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, as I said when we read it, that word plead simply means to judge. I'm going to judge them for what they've done with my people and with my land. That's the treatment of them. Because, as we said, they are the apple of God's eye. Whether or not they do the right thing. Now, what we want to do is have a bit of a look at how the nations have treated that land, which is God's land, which God in Genesis chapter 15 promised to Abraham and to his seed forever. And if we were to take Genesis chapter 15 and have a look at the size of the area of the land, it's very much more than the area of land which Israel has now, even now in 2017. In Genesis 15, God promised to Abraham and his seed a lot more land than what's in possession of. But what have the nations done with that land in the last hundred or so years? Well, World War I, there were some very interesting agreements that were going on behind the scenes during World War I. We have listed the three of them. You see, Britain and their allies entered into three key agreements in World War I as they determined what should be done when the Ottoman Empire was defeated. And so they planned to get rid of the Ottoman Empire and to break it up and to share it amongst all their allies. And what they have is, first of all, there was what's known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And it divided the area of the Ottoman Empire, including the land of Palestine as it was then known, Amongst the various nations, there was the French, there was the British, and there were various other countries, and I've forgotten whichever ones they were. Um, but they were divided amongst them. Originally, actually included Russia, but Russia pulled out because of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. So those areas were divided up, were going to be divided up. Now, that is current. That sykes pico agreement has made an appearance it's actually one of the big beefs of ISIS. ISIS is fighting wars a hundred years later because of that agreement. So you think it's ancient history, it's still a bugbear. That's Abu Bakr Bashir. He wants to get rid of that agreement, the effects of that agreement. That's literally how, how current that is. There's secondly about the Balfour Declaration, which was a letter, which was uh, basically a letter promising the formation of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, as the scriptures had foretold would happen. And we read briefly in Ezekiel chapter 38, there will be the mountains of Israel onto which Russia would come. Not the mountains of Palestine, it's the mountains of Israel. And so it's according to prophecy that Israel is a nation in that land again. The interesting fact of that is that the outcome of that, as far as the world is being concerned, is ongoing conflict, is it not, amongst the nations? Ongoing conflict. And then there was the correspondence between a, the High Commissioner in Egypt from 1915 to 1917, Henry McMahon, 
and a man by the name of Al Hussein Ibn Ali, the sheriff and Amir of Mecca. And in, the, in one of those letters, in particular, the letter dated the 24th of October 1916, Britain said this, Great Britain will guarantee the holy places. Now they're being guaranteed to the Emir of Mecca, the Muslims. So on one side, we've got a promise for Israel to have a state. On the other side, we've got a promise to the Arabs. We've got a promise to the Muslims that the holy places, they'll be guaranteed against all external aggression and will, be, will, will recognise their inviolability. In actual fact, the British Parliament argued over these things and what they meant after World War I. In the British Parliament, they argued over them because they were trying to make them all agree and they don't. But that's the agreements of men behind closed doors and what they do. A hundred years later, the world has got a lot of trouble because of those agreements. You see, what were they doing? They were parting God's land. Joel chapter 3. That's why they're going to be brought to the mountains of Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. That's why Russians are going to invade Israel precisely because of these things. Well, there's more parting to go on. 1947, the United Nations Resolution 181, where they agreed to partition the land of Palestine to form a homeland for the Jews. Now, if you ever want a definition of parting the land, have a look at that. You could just about throw a stone across the bit in the middle there. The very narrow neck that was given to Israel in the middle. An absolutely, totally undefendable situation, according to man's means. It's interesting that it really didn't last more than a few days in that state. But once again, they were dividing God's land. And that dividing of God's land and continued dividing has continued. You know, we've got 29th of November 1947, the United Nations resolution to partition Palestine to form a homeland for the Jews. And they said that Jerusalem would be a separate body administered by the United Nations. So we've got all this land and then Jerusalem's going to be different. May the 14th, 1948, Israel's declared a nation again. Immediately... The surrounding nations declared war. Well, you know what happened? Israel increased their boundaries. And in the 1949 armistice, Jordan's left in control of the east part of Jerusalem, while the western part is in control by Israel. So now Jerusalem's a divided city, parted again. Come June 1967, the Six Day War, Jerusalem was recaptured. They captured East Jerusalem. A move that was condemned by the United Nations in Resolution 242. The United Nations required that Israel withdraw from those areas. And there have been a number of resolutions since backing that requirement up. In 1980, Israel passed a law declaring that Jerusalem, complete and united, is the capital of Israel. And that law was declared null and void by the Security Council in Resolution 478 soon afterwards. Well, friends, that's continued. There's no different. In actual fact, it's only six months old. The United Nations, Resolution 2334, December 2016, six months ago. They just passed a resolution and it concerns Israel's settlements in Palestinian territories occupied since 1967, including East Jerusalem. The resolution passed in a 14 to 0 vote by members of the United Nations Security Council. And Barack Obama, in his very last act as president, just about abstained from voting. Normally, they would have vetoed the vote. That's quite often what America has done. And the resolution states that Israel's settlement activity constitutes a flagrant violation of international law and has no legal validity. You see what it's doing, friends, is putting Israel in a position where they are out of place with the rest of the world and Russia is perfectly justified 
if they decide they're going to enforce the resolution, just like America has enforced resolutions in Iraq and in Afghanistan. What is stopping Russia enforcing those resolutions? And so, friends, we can see that the parting of God's land is going to bring nations against Jerusalem in war very soon. Well, the Bible has a lot more to say about Jerusalem. We want to have a look at another chapter of the Bible, and that is particularly um, Zechariah chapter 12. It's the second last book of the Old Testament. But this is what Almighty God says about Jerusalem. Because, friends, I think this chapter, and we don't, once again, it's one of those chapters that we're going to be able to briefly pick a few eyes out of. But what we're going to see, friends, is that Jerusalem is an actual fact, was prophesied that this would be the problem in Zechariah chapter 12. Now, the first thing I want you to note is if you just go through this chapter and you've got a colouring in pencil, very good idea to colour in the phrase, I will, because this is what God is going to cause to be brought about because of the wickedness of man, because of the foolishness of man. God is going to cause it to happen because ultimately out of it, God is going to make Israel and the Jews acknowledge him and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where that chapter is, uh, is actually going. You see, what, it's, what we're told is in, in verse 1 and 2, well, particularly we'll pick it up in verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling or a cup of poison unto all people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and Jerusalem. You see what Joel chapter 3 says? He's going to gather all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Jerusalem. It's talking about the same events. But he says it's going to be a cup of trembling or a cup of poison. And it was a cup, it was a drink that was given to prisoners to dull their senses before they were executed. That's what Jerusalem's going to be. That's what it is. It's a cup of trembling. In verse 3, and in that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. You see, it's a cup of trembling. It's a burdensome stone. And NIV puts it a little bit differently. He says, I'll make Jerusalem an immovable rock. You can't fix the problem. They want to move it, they want to change it, but they can't fix it. And that's what the world's been like with Jerusalem in the last hundred years or so. And all to try, who try to move it will injure themselves. And so what we'd see if we were to go through that chapter is that all nations are going to be gathered against Jerusalem and they're going to be judged. And that's what Joel chapter 3 said. But Judah and Jerusalem is going to be saved and the Jews are going to be humbled and caused to acknowledge that they killed the Son of God and they're going to repent. And that's what told, that we're told at the end of that chapter, the last uh, five or so verses of that chapter. They're going to look upon him whom they pierced and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. They're going to recognise what God felt when they killed the Son of God and they're going to repent of that. You see what God's doing with these things? He's going to cause Israel to turn to him in truth. That's what God's doing. So why Israel? Because Israel needs to be humbled to acknowledge God. And it's only when this happens that these things will take place. Well, we want to now come back to the chapter that we read. Well, no, it's not the chapter that we read. The chapter that we alluded to um, in, in a bit of detail in Ezekiel chapter 38. We want to have a look at what the reasons are that are given in that chapter. Because in just about every chapter that we read about these things, God gives a reason why he's causing these things to come to pass. And in Ezekiel chapter 38, God gives a list of reasons. Well, he says this. We, we saw already that it was a work of God. I will turn thee back and I will put, bring thee forth. In verse 4. It's what God's going to do. He's going to force them in. He's going to cause them to do that because of the events that he's going to bring to pass with them. They're going to be caused to come down 
What's the reasons? Well, we saw before that it, that it was a religious company and it has a religious reason. You know, it's very interesting. Jerusalem is the, 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 one of the key cities of the four main religions of the world. And they all want to have their part. No wonder it's going to be a religious war because Russia is going to be aligned with the Catholic Church and they certainly want their piece of Jerusalem. So very interesting that that is the case. So there's a religious reason. There's an anti-Semitic reason. Russia's going to think an evil thought. We have that in verse 10. I didn't note it on the overhead. It's in verse 10. The only other use of that phrase, evil thought, is actually in Esther chapter 9 and verse 25 where Haman's anti-Semitic, not antiseptic, his anti-Semitic plan of genocide against the Jews was an evil thought. It's the only, two, only other time those two Hebrew words occur in that order in the Bible together. It's against Israel. You see, it's an anti-Semitic purpose that he has. It's a genocide purpose. And you can actually have a look at, at Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. It shows you that. They're going to come to obtain Israel's wealth, to take a spoil and to take a prey in verse 12, and to take away cattle and goods and silver and gold in verse 13. And so they're after wealth. And so there's the reasons that Russia's coming down. There's Russia's reasons. But they're a little bit different to God's reasons. Quite different. What's God's reasons? Well, verse 16. Verse 16, God says, that I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, or the nations may know God. Do the nations know and acknowledge God now? No, but they will then. When the might of man's military machine is destroyed before their eyes. When everything they've trusted in is brought crumbling down and all of a sudden they've got to turn to God. And that's what's going to happen. And the heathen are come, going to, or the nations are going to come to know Almighty God. And then we've looked at verses 19 to 23 in a little bit more detail already so we won't look at that again. Well, now I want to come back to Joel chapter 3 because I think there's a very, very beautiful little verse in Joel chapter 3. And I'm sorry we've gone backwards and forwards here, but I, I've done this in a specific order because I think it, it just, uh, um, we can pick the bits together more easily by doing it this way. We had in Joel chapter 3 that prophecy concerning the, uh, the nations are going to be gathered against Jerusalem because they'd scattered the Jews and they had parted God's land. And then what we see is that, in actual fact, when they come against Jerusalem, that in verse 16 we're told that the Lord shall roar out of Zion. In other words, he's going to come to Zion. The Lord is going to come to Zion in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens of the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So he's going to save them from the destruction that Russia is determined to bring. But this is what it says in verse 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no stranger pass through her any more. There's going to come a time when there'll be no stranger passing through that city. We're going to see there's a very interesting meaning about that phrase. No stranger. But let's look at those, verse, those words very, very carefully. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. What does that mean about Jerusalem now? It's not holy. And want me to show you why? Well, there's the Dome of the Rock. You've got the Muslim church with its shrine that dominates the city. Looks absolutely amazing place, but it's opposed to God. There's the tomb of the Virgin Mary, the so-called Virgin Mary. It's totally against the principles of Almighty God. 
There's the church of all nations. Do they worship God? No, they don't. There's the Armenian church being rebuilt. There's the Ethiopian church. There's the Russian compound church of the Holy Trinity and we go on for another 46 if you like. That's what's defiling that city. Church after church after church, they all disagree with each other and they all disagree with God. You see how it's unholy? It's totally unholy. And what did God say was going to happen in this place? There's going to be a great shaking in the land of Israel and every wall is going to fall to the ground. And what does it say in Joel chapter 3? That when all that's happened, no more will the stranger pass through that land. You know what the word stranger means? It means a stranger. It also means a strange woman or a harlot. And a harlot is a biblical term for an unfaithful religion. And that's what's filling that land today. Is the unfaithful religions of the world. The faithful religions, the faithful religion is called the bride of Christ, a chaste virgin. The unfaithful are harlots. And we know in Revelation chapter 17, it talks about the Catholic system as the mother of harlots. And there they are. That's what's defiling that city. But there's going to come a day when it's no longer defiled. When it's no longer a situation where God is determined to destroy it. You see, what God said in Ezekiel chapter 38 is there's going to be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And I want you to come with me to Zechariah chapter 14 because here is the last of the new references that I'm going to give you. But here is another chapter which actually talks about Armageddon. Zechariah chapter 14. Because what we're going to see, friends, is that destruction, that earthquake, won't only be in the land of Israel, it's going to be centred right on that city. And it's going to be centred right on that city for a reason. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be the divided again, uh, in the midst of thee. And I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Same events, isn't it? It's Armageddon. And there's the horrors of the war that are going to take place. And then verse 3, Then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall go removed toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And so the mountain of Olive is going to go north and south like that. Well, let's have a look at it. Very interesting. There's an aerial view. Now, you may not be able to see it, but here you've got the Dome of the Rock. You might just notice Islamic quarter, Christian quarter, Armenian quarter, Jewish quarter. They've divided the land, haven't they? Here you've got the Mount of Olives. Right here. Now I'm told that there's actually a fault line that runs east-west, and I'll show you that in a moment, through the Mount of Olives. This way, through the Mount of Olives. Uh, uh, one of the best drawings I could find seems to indicate it goes down like that. Alright? Now that's interesting. Because what are we told in Zechariah chapter 14? We're told in Zechariah chapter 14 that half of it's going to move toward the north and half of it toward the south. If there's a fault line going east and west, that's pretty logical, isn't it? All right. Well, what does the world have to say? What do the, the geological people tell us? Well, here's a, a, an interesting article. It's 13 years old. Okay, it's the NBCnews.com. Jerusalem's old city at risk in earthquake. It's at risk, all right. And I'll tell you, 
It's going to be turned into rubble. All right? That's what this earthquake is going to do. It's going to destroy all those churches because the city's got to be holy. It tells us that the last big earthquake in the area was 1927 when a magnitude 6.3 quake centred near Jericho about 15 miles to the east of Jerusalem killed more than 200 people. There was a bit of damage to some of the buildings in Jerusalem at the time as well. Not too bad. They're all still standing. That was 90 years ago. And in an area where there's a fault line, if there's no releases, the pressure builds up. What that tells you is that sooner or later there's going to be a big one. Isn't that what we've been reading all night? That Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that every wall is going to fall to the ground. That concurs with the news we're reading. Not only do they say that, but they say this. The layer below is not made of solid rock, but rather a kind of rubble. That's interesting. I find that very interesting. Uh, it's probably white rock. It's going to make beautiful building material. That's what it's going to do. It's going to make absolutely beautiful building material. Those weak foundations would magnify an earthquake seismic wave. What it's telling you is that very easily the lot is going to be buried. According to another website, it's actually the Mount of Olives, I think it's the Mount of Olives official website, this is what they say. He says, according to the Mount of Olives website, there is a fault line from east to west in the southern portion of the Mount of Olives. There it is. It's quite logical. You can see exactly what's going to happen there. But what is going to happen? Well, all of that mess is going to be buried by that earthquake. And Jerusalem is going to be established in the top of the mountain. Let's go to... I did tell you that was my last quote, but I really think we need to go to Isaiah chapter 2 to finish our evening this evening. Isaiah chapter 2, because this is the outcome of that earthquake. It does parallel with a few of the words that are further on in Zechariah chapter 14, but in Isaiah chapter 2 there's a very beautiful passage which explains to us a little bit about what this picture is showing us. You see, what we see in Isaiah chapter 2, it's, we're told it's a prophecy concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the last days. And we've been reading about the latter days and the last days a number of times this evening. And we're told, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now, we're told that that, that mountain there is Mount Zion. That's Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. It describes that. And that mountain is Mount Zion. Now, at the moment, that's only a little mound. But we're told in Isaiah chapter 2 that it's going to be in the top of the mountains. That's the effect of that earthquake. That's what it's going to do. And there's this big temple that's going to be built there. And here's a description, of, a, a, a description of this temple. It's going to be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. So instead of coming for war, what are they going to come for? And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You see the change is going to take place. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ was to return today and to go to the churches that are in Jerusalem, say, Look, um, you, need to, you need to come to learn about the truth. They'd all tell him to get lost, wouldn't they? But do it this way, and man will be humbled, and they'll come and worship God, and they'll choose to come and learn. And that's because man is not humbled easily, because man is full of pride, and that pride has to be brought down, and the wickedness of man has to be judged, and then Almighty God is going to be able to create a situation where all the nations are going to come to Jerusalem. And that highway out of Egypt is going to be used. And Egypt's going to be friends with Israel because they worship God. So friends, I hope we've given you the answer as to why Russia is going to invade Egypt and Israel. It's to humble them in preparation for them to receive Almighty God. Well, friends, we have a choice. We can do nothing.
and we can be caught up in the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. That won't be nice. Or we can join our, in, in the company of the Lord Jesus Christ by baptism and be a part of the group of people that are going to teach the nations God's ways from Jerusalem. The choice is yours, friends. We hope we make the right one. We thank you for your time.